Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, 2016 Division of Theological and Historical Studies lecture event. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Michael Bird. Michael is lecturer in theology at Ridley College in Melbourne, Australia, having taught in New Testament at Highland Theological College in Scotland and in theology at Crossway College in Brisbane. A tireless researcher, Michael has written and edited over 20 books in the field of the Septuagint, historical Jesus, the Gospels, Paul, uh, biblical theology, and systematic theology. Noteworthy is his book, Evangelical Theology, which, in which he uh, seeks to develop a truly gospel-based theology as well as, well as uh, his uh, another noteworthy book, award-winning book, The Gospel of the Lord, How the Early Church Wrote the Story of Jesus. Michael describes himself as a biblical theologian who endeavors to bring together biblical studies and systematic theology. He believes that the purpose of the church is to gospelize, that is to preach and promote and practice the gospel story of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is known by his students for his, and those who are around him for any period of time as uh, having a mix of humor as well as intellectual rigor, making theology and biblical studies both entertaining and challenging. Michael lives in Melbourne with his wife, Naomi, and his four children. He enjoys the rugby league, uh, running, cooking, trying to explain cricket to an American such as me. He speaks often in conferences in Australia and the UK and in the United States. And he's also uh, has a popular blog called Euangelion, a postmodern blog on scripture, faith, and following Jesus. So you might want to check out that blog on a regular occasion. Michael, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, the podium is yours. Well, good day. Uh, it is great to be here uh, back in New Orleans. Uh, I always enjoy my time down here. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful whenever I come and go that I didn't get eaten by an alligator. Uh, in Australia, we don't have alligators, we have crocodiles, which are about three times bigger and even meaner. So, yeah, it's, it's good to be here. But my topic for today is, it, it might seem like a, a weird sort of question, what is evangelical about evangelical theology? It, it might seem like a pretty ridiculous, but I think this is a very, very good question. And I'll tell you why. There are many things about America that baffle me. Why is the cheese orange? Why don't you use the metric system? Who are these evangelicals who vote for Donald Trump? <laughs> but also there is an evangelical theological society that doesn't actually define what the evangel is, the gospel is. And it's called the Evangelical Gospel Society, but they never tell you what the gospel is. In fact, you don't even need to believe the gospel to be a member. You have to believe a few other things. But my, the center of gravity in my paper, what I'm going to present today, is to talk about what the gospel is and why it matters for theology. So what is evangelical about evangelical theology? Now some might say that evangelical theology is simply any theology which is done by an evangelical. And I could think of several very good volumes on theology, you might have read them. Those by Millard Erickson, Wayne Grudem, Gerald Bray or Michael Horton to name a few recent ones. But then again, one might point out that their theology, both its content and shape, is determined by factors that have nothing to do with their self-identification as evangelicals. It might even be the case that being a Baptist or a Presbyterian or holding to a certain doctrinal system like Calvinism or dispensationalism, that exhibits more control over their beliefs than anything to do with the evangel. 
On top of that, we should also consider the diversity of their methods and conclusions. And we would have to conclude if each author were doing evangelical theology, evangelical theology would be so, di be di be so, uh, would be so diverse as to be incoherent. It seems to me, however, that evangelical theology is not simply the sum theology declared by evangelical people. My contention, or what I think it should be, is that evangelical theology is resourced in the evangelical tradition and it results in the promotion of the evangelical mission. I want to argue that what makes evangelical theology coherent and convincing is that evangelical theology constitutes a web of beliefs that makes the evangel, the gospel, the center, boundary, and integrating theme of theology. But before we press on with that idea, we need to deal with two questions about evangelical theology. The first one is, what is evangelicalism? Now, what constitutes evangelicalism and how do you define it is a subject that historians and sociologists all disagree over. The meaning of the term evangelical is used divisively and derisively. Where I come from in Australia, one of the worst things you can call someone would be an evangelical. In Germany, the name Evangelische Kirche is used to describe the Protestant church, the largely Lutheran church. Over in Germany, Evangelisch basically means not Catholic. But I've also seen some funny uses of evangelical in adjectival sense. One of my favorite celebrity chefs is Nigella Lawson, and she had her Christmas special on TV, and she said, when it comes to cooking a good Christmas dinner, I am positively evangelical about it. By which she means she has bucket loads of enthusiasm for it. I've noticed in the US that the term evangelical is used to describe everyone from Westboro Baptist Church to Joel Osteen and everyone in between. A recent book on the spectrum of evangelicalism lists no less than four species of evangelicalism, including fundamentalism, confessional evangelicalism, generic evangelicalism, and post-conservative evangelicalism, with each one claiming to be the real evangelicalism. Makes me want to ask, will the real evangelical please stand up? Resultantly, some have argued that the term evangelical has become so broad and so nebulous as to be practically meaningless, and we might as well even give it up. I have a friend of mine, he is in Alabama, and he no longer uses the word evangelical to describe himself. His beliefs have not changed, but he prefers to call himself simply orthodox. You can see the attraction as to why. Now, my own proposal, following largely on the work of Stanley Grenz, a Baptist theologian, is that evangelicalism is primarily a post-Reformation renewal movement. It emerged out of a convergence of Puritans and Pietists in the 17th century when they found themselves in close proximity and with converging interests in piety, evangelism, missions, and social concern. The result is what Donald Dayton has called convertive piety. Much later, after the modernist controversy, evangelicalism crystallized after the Second World War as a post-fundamentalist movement with a commitment to doctrinal orthodoxy on the one hand, but also cultural engagement on the other hand. Modern evangelicalism at its heart has a shared experience cradled in a shared theology, says Grenz. That experience of one of conversion and grace and a shared theology like the Bebbington Quadrilateral, which focuses on the Bible, conversion, the cross, and being active in your community, or a similar cluster of beliefs about the gospel. That is what brings these people together. As such, this, these burgeoning evangelicals were not simply pragmatists, reformers, and preachers. They had a conscious theology centered on the gospel, which drove their work. 
defined their priorities and enabled them to partake of cross-denominational cooperation. Viewed this way, evangelicalism is missional activism. If that's what it means to be an evangelical, what then is theology? Well, there's any number of definitions of theology. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth contended that dogmatics is the self-examination of the Christian church in respect of the content of its distinctive talk about God. Alternatively, another theologian, Yaroslav Pelikan, regarded theology is what the church of Jesus Christ teaches, believes, confesses on the basis of the word of God. This is Christian doctrine. Such definitions, I think, are essentially correct, but they do restrict theology to a cognitive linguistic sphere. In other words, theology becomes reduced to stuff I ought to believe. I would never, for one, deny that theology has propositional content and a cognitive horizon. Yes, we do believe stuff. We do have creeds and confessions. Theology is, as Anselm wonderfully said, faith-seeking understanding. And theology defines what it is we understand. However, I would suggest that theology is about more than increasing the breadth and depth of our theological knowledge. Theology is something that is learned as it is lived, preached, and prayed. Theology may be stated in confession, but it's worked out in mission. Theology is the conversation that takes place between family members in the household of faith about what it means to behold God, to belong to God, and to believe in God. Theology verbalizes our experience of God, provides the structure to our belief of God, and defines the role of God's people in the mission of God. Theology, according to Kevin Van Hootser, is the attempt to assure that those who bear Christ's name learn to walk in Christ's way. If that is the case, then theology is not purely a cerebral exercise. It is a spiritual dynamic and even practically dramatic. To use a, to use a metaphor, theology can be likened to learning to take part in a production of a theological drama. To do theology is to describe the God who acts, to be acted upon and to become an actor in the divine drama of God's plan to repossess the world for himself. Kevin Van Hootser prosecutes this drama metaphor quite rigorously when he sees the task of theology as to enable disciples to perform the script of the scriptures. According to the advice of the dramaturge, the Holy Spirit, in obedience to the designs of the director, Jesus Christ, with the gospel as the theme music and performed in the theater of the church. The church, as the company of the gospel, show what they believe in an open-air performance stage for the benefit of the world. Viewed this way, the purpose of theology is to comprehend the drama and to prepare ourselves for participation in the drama. So, so far we've looked at evangelicalism and theology. What then is evangelical theology? If evangelicalism is a type of missional activism and if theology is a dramaturgical performance of the story of God that we ourselves are caught up in, uh, then this is what I would say evangelical theology is. Evangelical theology is that theology which results in the systematic appropriation of the gospel to faith, to life, to mission, to ministry. I would suggest that evangelical theology is like staging your own little production of Godspell. It entails exploring the implications of the gospel for all areas of life and behavior in light of the biblical storyline with a view to stimulating the church's performance of its faith in the public square. Evangelical theology describes the ideational content of faith, what we believe, and drives us towards practical ways to live out that faith. This mixture of assent and action is what I call gospelizing, the attempt to shape the life and mission of the church according to the gospel. And here I should acknowledge one of my 
old teachers, Jim Gibson, for giving me this language. There's one thing you remember today from this lecture, not the crazy guy with the red hair who sounds like you, Jackman. I want you to remember that word, gospelizing. Because when you tenderize a piece of meat, the whole piece of meat becomes what? When you magnetize a piece of metal, the whole piece of metal becomes what? When you sterilize a surgical tool, the whole, piece of, of the whole tool becomes what? So when you are gospelized, what do you become? Yeah, you begin to embody the realities of the gospel. You become the new creation. Your church becomes the city on the hill. You become the disciples that Jesus calls you to be. That is what gospelizing is, becoming the reality that the gospel both declares you and makes you. Dedication to this art of gospelizing is vital. It's vital for discipleship. It's vital for growth. It's vital for our churches. Uh, again, let me lean on Van Hootzer. He says, evangelicals need to recapture a passion for biblical formation, a desire to be formed, reformed, and transformed by the truth and power of the gospel. Consequently, Evangelical theology is the task for disciples of Jesus to begin excavating the manifold truth of the gospel and to start reflecting the spiritual realities that the gospel endeavors to cultivate in their own lives. For an interim conclusion, tautological as it may sound, what makes evangelical evangelical is the place of the evangel, the good news, in our theology. The crucial ingredient of such theology, it's sine qua non, the thing with which we cannot proceed without. The fulcrum, the center of gravity, is the gospel. It is the gospel that announces to us the divine drama of redemption and recruits us to be participants in the drama. The affirmation and appropriation of the gospel are key marks of evangelical theology. The Puritan John Owen said, evangelical theology is a spiritual gift bestowed by the Holy Spirit on the mind of believers. And believers are, by definition, those born again by the grace of God. Evangelical theology is theology that emerges from the new birth wrought by the Holy Spirit. Now, this all sounds well and good, doesn't it? You know, yes, yes, there's more gospel. Yes, yes, I like gospel. Do you like gospel? I like gospel. Yes, let's have more gospel in our churches, more gospel in our theology. But let's put some flesh on that as to how it actually works out. I'm going to contend that the gospel, this evangelical theology, should have the gospel as its center, boundary, and integrating theme. As the center, the gospel provides a point of reference allowing us to orientate ourselves in relation to God, the world, and the church. Without a central fixture, we would run the risk of trying to grasp, hold onto something, perhaps anything, to provide an anchor for faith. Believers, that central fixture is the gospel, the good news that God has revealed himself in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, and it's through faith and repentance in him that we can be saved and share in God's new world. That gospel is the central fixture. Not only that, but the gospel has centri uh, centri uh, centripetal force that constantly draws us towards the triune God, specifically the Father's love, the personal work of Christ, and the life in the Spirit. Making the gospel central means it will always be our guide and gravitational pull towards the triune God. Only a triune God can do what is done and announced in the gospel. In addition to being the center of theology, the gospel is also the boundary of theology because it defines the limits between belief and false belief and unbelief. What the New Testament authors say about the gospel shows that Christianity has an essentially confessional content. There is some stuff you must believe to be a Christian, not least the confession of Jesus as Lord. Time and again in Paul's letter to the Galatians or in the epistles of John, the gospel of Christ is the line that separates orthodoxy from heresy. 
In the developing church of the second and third century, the Gospels were situated in its redemptive historical context. In these early summaries, they would call the regular fide or the rule of faith, which was a summary of the biblical storyline that culminates in Christ and the salvation that God brings in him. Thus, orthodox, creedal, confessional faith has always been born of the gospel. I think that's summarized beautifully in the Heidelberg Catechism. In question 22, it is asked, what is it then necessary for a Christian to believe? And the answer is, all things promised to us in the gospel, which the articles of our Catholic undoubted Christian faith briefly teach us. That is a definition that keeps the essentials essential, but leaves room for other matters that are secondary or adiaphora or inconsequential. In addition to being the center and the boundary of our faith, the gospel is also the integrating theme of the theological project. Because all theological topics can have their content in some sense shaped or determined by the gospel. That is to say, the gospel necessarily and inevitably shapes what we think about God, the end times, humanity, and the church. For example, let me give a, a few incidences of this. We could say that uh, theology proper, the doctrine of God, is really about the God of the gospel. Karl Barth said that word evangelical will objectively designate that theology that speaks of the God of the gospel. Christology means unpacking the manifold significance in the life and work of Christ as it's narrated in the four Gospels and taught in the Apostles' Gospel of Jesus Christ. Christian ethics means, as Paul says in Philippians, living a life worthy of the Gospel, having obedience that accompanies our confession of the Gospel. According to Oliver O'Donovan, the foundation of Christian ethics must be evangelical foundations. Or to put it more simply, Christian ethics must arise from the gospel of Jesus Christ, otherwise it could not be Christian ethics. The study of the Holy Spirit focuses on new birth as the promise of the gospel. The study of salvation unpacks the polyphonic richness of the gospel of salvation and tells us of the God of sa who saves. Apologetics is the defense of the gospel. Applied theology, is, it works itself in, in ministry. As, as Derek Tidwell says, the gospel determines everything about the pastor. His motives, authority, methods, and character are all governed by the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel links together the various subfields of Christian theology. The scarlet th thread running through an evangelical theology is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, John Wesley, I think, put it wonderfully when he wrote in one of his letters, "Go on in the work where to God has go on in the work where God has called you. He will do all things well. I hope our preachers preach and live the gospel. I am." Now, if we were to uh, apply this paradigm to one particular area of the gospel, sorry, one particular area of theology. What would it be? Well, the one I want to use as an example is that of the doctrine of the church. Evangelicals have normally been accused of having a fairly low view of the church. In fact, uh, one friend of mine quipped that for many evangelicals, um, the church is basically the weekly meeting of Jesus' Facebook friends. It's probably a good way of putting it. Uh, but I, I like what John Stott says about evangelicals in the church. He says, One of our chief evangelical blind spots has been to overlook the central importance of the church. We tend to proclaim individual salvation without moving on to the saved community. We emphasize that Christ died for us to redeem us from all iniquity rather than to purify for himself a people of his own, as we find in First Peter. We think of ourselves more as Christian than churchmen. And our message is more of good news than of new life in a new society. But I tend to think that a, a, a true bona fide evangelical position should have a very rich, high, and authentically Catholic view of the church. I, I want to say from the outset that there is a symbiotic relationship between gospel and church. To begin with, the church is created by the word, not just any word, but by the gospel word. 
The gospel creates a community to follow Jesus Christ, to know and love God and to walk in the Spirit. The church is evangelically constituted and so the evangel becomes the defining mark of its ethos. The gospel we preach shapes the kind of churches we create and the type of churches we create in turn shapes the type of gospel we preach. Belief in the gospel signifies our entry point into the faith. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the chief emblems of the gospel and they ensure that the gospel is remembered, visualized and even experienced on a regular basis. Discipleship in the church is matter to, a matter of learning to live out the realities that the gospel creates and proclaiming the gospel as the mission of the church. That is why I think we should think of church as the community of the gospelized and the gospelizing. When a person or a church is gospelized, they use gospel, they believe Jesus, they overflow with spirit, they radiate the Father's glory. That is the goal of the gospelized community. Our end is to be and become the church that knows the gospel, preaches the gospel, and lives according to the gospel. Now we could expound this further. I would say the church is firstly the company of the gospel. As I've already noted, Kevin Van Hootser has argued that doctrine helps individuals in the church perform the theodrama of the Christian life by enabling them to understand their identities as persons made new in Christ. On this telling, the church is like a company of actors that is cast to perform the redemptive drama of the gospel. The church gathers together, scripted by the scriptures, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, illuminated by our traditions, to be built up into Christ. We go to church to rehearse, to celebrate, and to better understand the drama of redemption that teaches us in the gospel of Christ. Second, we could say, the church is the public face of the gospel. I'm drawn to this feature by a book by, by a scholar called J.L. Holden. The central thesis of the volume is that the history of Christian origins cannot be told apart from the history of the institution of the church. Holden makes the point that Christology, it's the doctrine of Christ, however diversely expressed, was the driving force in most New Testament understandings of Christian community. The unity of Christians was not a collection of normative myths, not a sacred book, but a people comprised of a unity related to Christ. The problem is, however, that the institutionalization of the church has tended to obscure the fundamental thrust of the gospel and become an, un, uh, an unsatisfactory vehicle for the message. You may have experienced this. The best and the worst thing about the church are its Christians. Yet the church is the home of Jesus and, and his people. And if they are to gather together to worship and engage in mission, they must walk through its doors. General revelation, that's what we get from nature, will not establish a saving faith. Instead, it pours oil on the bonfires of idolatries in the human heart. Even special revelation, which we get from Scripture, cannot lead to authentic faith apart from someone coming along us, like Philip alongside the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch, and explaining Scripture to him. The church is not a dispensable footnote in God's plan of salvation. God calls a people so that a transformed people will transform the world. And this is the church who are fishers of men, the salt of the earth, branches on the vine and olive tree, a letter from Christ, God's building, ambassadors of reconciliation, wine and bread, an ark of salvation, exiles in a foreign land, and a kingdom of priests or to use the image from the epistle to Diognetus, that's a second century document. The church is to the world as a soul is to the body. These images have the qualities of reaching, finding, telling, and nourishing others. The church is a living monument to the gospel, therefore its lights, doors, windows, occupants should reflect the gospel with all the energy and brightness of a Disney parade. The church is the only gospel many people will hear, the only Bible they ever read, and the only Jesus many will meet. Third, and let me add, the church is the hermeneutic of the gospel. 
Uh, this was a point that was made famously and fabulously by the missiologist Leslie Newbegin. Newbegin wondered how it could be that the gospel should become credible in a pluralistic society and that people would come to believe that the power of God over human affairs was manifested in the cross of Christ. For Newbegin, the answer, and he said, the only hermeneutic of the gospel is a congregation of men and women who believe it and live by it. Jesus did not write a book, but formed a community around him. A community that at its heart remembers his deeds and words. And this community, Newbegin said, had six characteristics. It will be a community of praise, a community of truth, a community that does not live for itself but is concerned in local affairs for others. It will be a community where men and women are prepared and sustained and the calling God has placed upon them. It will be a community of mutual responsibility and it will be a community of hope. Newbegin concludes that if the gospel is to challenge our society and claim the high ground, it will not be done by forming Christian political parties. It will be done by embodying the gospel. In these brief remarks on how gospel impacts theology, we've seen that in an evangelical approach, the church is the company of the gospel, the public face of the gospel, and the hermeneutic of the gospel. So I would say an evangelical ecclesiology is, as corny as it sounds, the attempt to be the gospel-driven church. Let me come to a close now. In conclusion, I like the words of John Webster, who said, an evangelical theology is one that is evoked, governed, and judged by the gospel. I have argued that evangelicalism is a movement defined by its commitment to the gospel and when, it, and when it does its best it results in evangelism, mission and social reform. While theology is indeed confessional, it should also be transformational. As such I prefer to think of theology in terms of a, a dramaturgical metaphor where, uh, which expresses theology in collected propositions and corporate performance. More specifically, I use the, uh, the terminology of gospelizing to describe such a theology, since the task of evangelical theology is to infuse gospel into the faith, life, and myth mission of the church. The justification for this, it is the gospel that authenticates our faith and authorizes our mission. The gospel is the center, boundary, and integrating theme of theology. And as an example of this, I've set forth a, an initial description of the church, where what an evangelical view of the church would look like. And we could add this as part of a larger project to prosecute the role of the gospel in constructing an evangelical theology. I, I think this project is significant. Uh, not only my own part, but others who might labor in a similar vineyard. But it's important because what is at stake? Let me leave you with this thought. Did you know Charlie Chaplin once entered a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest and came second? It's true. In our churches, I fear much the same way of the gospel. If you preach a gospelette, you'll get a Christianette. If you preach a truncated gospel, you'll get a truncated Christian. You preach a half-baked gospel, you get a half-baked disciple. If we build our theology on, on any other foundation other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, the risk is that we'll build a house of cards and it will collapse from the slightest tremor of pluralistic philosophy, or it will be burned up when our own ministries are tested on the day of judgment. It is only the eternal gospel, as John the Seer calls it, that will provide an adequate foundation for an authentic and robust evangelical theology. And in the words of the great American philosopher, Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much.
Michael. We do have some time for questions and answers. We hope answers, right? Yeah. Questions, Q&A. We have microphones at the end of each aisle, so you're welcome to come up and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Bird. Hi, I'm Charles Ratcliffe, a uh, student here at NOBTS. I'll probably be seeing you Sunday, so I'm going to yeah. just get this question out the way. Um, we spoke earlier about on the five views of inerrancy, okay? Uh, you used a term precision. I'm not, we're not denying that you believe that the Bible is without infallibility. I just want you to state your position, uh, your position on it. And what did you mean by the word uh, precision? Because uh, there are some who have taken the word inerrancy and, and ran with it and you feel that you can explain hydrodynamics and certain things like that. Would you please uh, explain your position? Okay, let me back up a, a bit. Uh, in all Christian traditions, they will argue with some sort of language that the Bible is true and trustworthy. Whether you're Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, if you're in Africa, Russia, South America, all Christians would say that the Bible is true. Uh, the issue has been how it is true and to what extent. And that has created certain controversies. And I'll be perfectly honest, it is only within the American context that it's become a real incendiary issue. If someone comes out and flat out denies the Bible, we can get that. But within America, there, there seems to be debates about, well, what is inerrancy? Uh, how does it apply and how does that provide a, a palisade or a, a barrier against false belief? And so there's been multiple definitions of inerrancy offered in the American context with everyone claiming theirs is the real bona fide version and everyone else is on a slippery slope to, um, I don't know, Arizona? Is it Arizona downhill from here? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> not even close? Everything's uphill from here. Like, maybe we are at the end of the slippery slope then. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> and so, if, like, if you want a statement on the Bible, for example, is Genesis 1 true? I believe Genesis 1 is true. I mean, it's true because God made the heavens and the earth. The question is, is it true as a scientific account? Is it true as a literalist account? The problem is those questions uh, require hermeneutical answers. And when you do that, you're going to enter into some sort of debate and there are going to be different options. But this is often, this is what I think happens. A lot of people end up preaching the inerrancy of the text, but the real thing they're going for is the inerrancy of their interpretation. And, and that's what I think the problem is. It's one thing to say scripture is true, it's another thing to say how it was true and what is the consequences of configuring it that way. Is that kind of approximately to, to what you're asking for? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No worries. That was an easy question to begin with, just solving the uh, inerrancy debate. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Bird. I'm Zach White. I'm a student here. Um, I would just like to know what your opinion is about the new perspective on Paul and what are its implications for evangelical theology. Okay. Um, the first thing I'll tell you is the new perspective is no longer new. Uh, it's, it's pretty old. It's, um, it's been around. And to be honest, the party has kind of moved on in biblical studies. I gave a lecture a, a week or so ago in Houston about um, Pauline theology. Uh, for those who don't know, the new perspective in Paul was a movement that had antecedents in the 1970s came to the fore in the 80s, but then really in the 90s and noughties it became a very prominent and controversial movement because it argued that uh, Judaism was not a religion of, of legalistic self-righteousness. And if that is the case, uh, then what did Paul find wrong with it? And these new perspective on Paul chaps said, well, the problem with Judaism was not legalism, the problem was ethnocentrism. It's not that they were trying to earn salvation, they were saying that salvation is limited to the Jewish people. The frustration I have is I think both of, of these issues go together, okay? Paul was censuring 
a type of theology, a view of salvation where you have to do the law. But if you do the law, you will end up becoming Jewish. So you could say it is in some sense legalistic and in some sense ethnocentric. Uh, the, 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 the two simply go together. Uh, those in the Protestant tradition, though, have had a tendency to think purely in, in personal and vertical categories about my standing before God. And they haven't really thought about the uh, horizontal elements of what it means to be justified. Let me give, give you a good example of that. I often ask students, why was Jesus cursed on the cross? In Galatians 3, Paul says Christ became a curse, cursed on the cross for us. I say, why did that happen? And they give me fairly stock standard answers, so we could be saved, so we could be forgiven, so we could be justified, which in its own sense are all true statements. But that's not what Paul says in Galatians 3. You see, all my students answer in their personal, individual standing before God, when Paul addresses the question, why was Christ cursed on the cross? He says that so that we might be redeemed and the blessing of Abraham would go to the Gentiles. Paul's answer is far more redemptive historical and about how God is bringing in people to himself, creating a church from Jew and Gentile. He's building the family of Abraham. That is justification by faith. That is the element that I think uh, Protestants, evangelicals have often forgotten, that social side to the doctrine of justification. And that has got some very tremendous implications because if you do believe that justification is the act, where he creates a new people with a new status and a new covenant and a new age. That means nobody gets asked to sit at the back of the bus because you believe you're all one in Christ Jesus. If we had had a different theology of justification in the last 200 years, I am convinced race relations would be different. Uh, that's a provocative statement, but I think it's definitely true. Is that good enough? Can we give me a pass on that? Okay, no worries. Dr. Bird, do you believe that the gospel is the center only of an evangelical systematic theology, or would that work also in an evangelical biblical theology as a center? <sighs> That's a very good question. Um, I mean, in a, in, a, in a biblical theology, I think you could do it. I mean, certainly in a New Testament theology. I mean, the fact you've got to read four books called gospel before you get to Paul, I think means God was trying to teach us something. It's like, okay, you people are kind of stupid. So I'm going to repeat this four times before you get the point, which I find is, is, is weird because a lot, of, a lot of evangelicals treat the Gospels as the optional chips and dips before you get to Paul. It's like, it's like Jesus is the John the Baptist for Paul's theology, you know? And I have heard a very prominent you know, preacher ask the question, did Jesus agree with Paul's theology? Where I think the question should be, did Paul agree with Jesus' theology? So I like to think we need a bit more gospel and gospels in the center of our theology, in a biblical theology, uh, definitely so. But there's different ways of doing biblical theology. You can do it thematically, you can do it canonically. Uh, I haven't really thought about that. I'm more concerned with the big picture of how you put everything together, your doctrine of the church, your doctrine of Christ, of God, how that applies to discipleship, mission, that kind of thing. And I think in that big picture, that big integrated web of ideas and things, that the gospel's got to be there because it's the gospel that brings us to Christ. Christ is to us as he is in the gospel. Otherwise, he can become a mere teacher or he can be, simply become a supernatural celebrity or someone I pray to that will give me cool stuff when things go bad. So I think that's why we make the gospel the center of everything and hopefully biblical theology will feed into that. No worries. Okay, I think we may be done, or maybe it's time for nap time, I don't know. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Hope to see you again tonight. Uh, Dr. Bird will be back this evening for our Gary Heard Point Counterpoint Forum as a feature speaker, along with Bart Ehrman.
and that event starts at 7 o'clock, so you have time to take that afternoon nap and come back and, uh, and enjoy the, um, the forum tonight. Yes, Bob. Okay, so uh, we, we do have some of Dr. Bird's books out here. We would, uh, he is, will be available to sign a copy if you'd like to buy a copy, and he would like for you to buy a copy. Yeah, I'm just gonna add something to okay. um, If you wanna know what this looks at like in practice, there actually is a volume called Evangelical Theology I've written, so if you think maybe the crazy redhead guy's worth following in this, uh, check that out, that's probably the best place. And as my wife says anyway, I'm much better in print than person. <laughs>